thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to talk about this really fascinating topic of the bronze soldier in Tallinn and the war of memories that happened a decade ago in, in Estonia. And um, touching, of course, the sensitive relationship with the Russian Federation. And of course, this whole conflict that em evolved around this, this uh, Soviet memo memorial is something that has to do with this uh, post-imperial um, conflict in terms of how to interpret uh, common, common pasts. So what I'm going to present to you in the 20 minutes I have is this short overview about this um, yeah, memory conflict in Estonia. What you see here is the reason why this conflict really occupied the news worldwide when um, the so-called Bronze Nights happened in Tallinn in April 2007. Um, something that Tallinn hadn't seen and experienced before. Masses of, of younger people who marched to, through the city center and um, plundered shops, destroyed windows and things like that. And apparently everything had to do with history, right? I mean, it seems like unbelievable and it was unbelievable because Mostly, these this vandalism did not actually have to do anything with history. If you look at the numbers of, of arrested at that night, it was like 600 Russians, 300 Estonians, and um, people were just murdering throughout the night. And um, my favorite example to demonstrate is, is always the fact that what was demolized and what was um, robbed were luxury luxury shops like Prada or Versace, but if it happened that the representation of the U European Union was situated next to a Versace shop, nothing happened to this European Union representation. So the bone of contention was this Soviet war memorial dedicated to the so-called liberation of Tallinn in 1944. And what you see here is actually one of the first celebrations of this um, moment of victory, the stay of victory, the Soviet victory in the Great Patriotic War that happened in, in Tallinn after regaining of, of independence, at least that so many people gathered again in that site, re-elevating this kind of Soviet traditions. And what was worrying the Estonians the most was actually the fact that it was not only veterans of war that were commemorating their fate and their comrades and things like that. But it was also this whole practice of commemorating the Soviet victory was introduced also to, to the younger generation. Um, some words about the historical conflict in the beginning. I'm not going through it in any detail, but as I already mentioned, it has to do with the different versions of a shared past after an empire broke down. We have the same issue concerning the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire, that um, broke apart during the, the year of 1917, thanks to the Russian Revolution. And already here, we have different interpretation of this shared past in this um, Russian Empire. What is important for the story of the Bronx soldiers, of course, the history of the second half of the 20th century, the story that is being known in the Baltic view, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian view, as the loss of independence thanks to Soviet aggression in June 1940, just at the same time when Hitler was uh, entering Paris, the Red Army was occupying the territory of the three independent Baltic states, not the least because of the um, famous Hitler-Stalin pact concluded in autumn 19. 39, which divided the spheres of interest in, in Europe between Hitler and Stalin. And according to this um, contract, the Baltic states belonged in the spheres of interest of the Soviet Union. Still today, for official Russian histories, um, you will find the idea that actually in June 1940, the three Baltic states joined voluntarily um, the USSR even if we know that it was actually initially a military occupation with the help of the Red Army. And later on, this was changed into a political annexation of the three Baltic states um, into the Soviet Union. And after the three years of, of German occupation during the Second World War, the Red Army 
simply regained, reoccupied the territory of the Baltic states in the year 1944. So this is the historical background for this um, memorial. And it was something that was very close to the political agenda of the Soviet Union to celebrate this victory, especially in the territories that were now under Soviet control. And so the question was how to do it and what kind of narrative to be chosen for, for this commemoration of this victory on territories that used to be independent states before, in, before World War II. So they choose the story of liberation, liberation from Nazi occupation, of course. And what you see here is a demonstration how important this whole endeavor to rewrite history actually was in the eyes of, of the Soviet rulers at that time. Already in June 1945, just a month after the uh, victory, we have this first sketch of the place where later the Bronx soldier was to be placed. And the place, the square was called the Liberator's Square to make it clear to everybody that this is the place to celebrate the Liberators of Tallinn from, from the Nazi yoke. Initially, there was a small wooden monument erected on this site to make it clear that this is already a kind of sacred Soviet site. But this uh, wooden monument was being blown up by two Estonian schoolgirls on the eve of the first anniversary of the big victory in May 46. So right from the start, you have this kind of conflict engraved into this particular site, close to the heart of the Estonian um, capital. The monument, like it was re erected in uh, September, 1947 it was inaugurated just on the eve of the day of the so-called liberation of Tallinn in September 1947, 21st of September. It is in a way an exception to the visual language that the Soviet government used in other, in other countries of uh, East Central Europe. At that time, usually you would always have the figure of a mother with a child, or the figure of a soldier with a child. Just think of the famous memorial in the Berlin um, Treptow Park, where you have also the figure of a child. Just in order to make clear that it was a kind of liberation, a liberation for the sake of the next generation of Soviet citizens, or in the case of Berlin, for the citizens of the German Democratic Republic. In the Estonian case, you just have the figure of a mourning soldier, which really makes this, this monument quite special in the context of the memorials that were erected at that time. And I haven't really researched this question, but as far as I know, it was the sculptor N. Rose who actually rejected the figure of a child. And so this is the result. I think it was very important for the Soviet authorities to have this monument erected to celebrate the idea of liberation of Tallinn. And so they went along with this um, changed um, sketch of, of, of the memorial. As we know, during the first decades of post-war Soviet Russia, the war as such was not really being massively commemorated in a way like we like we know it from from the late Soviet period and like we know it also from from the Russian Federation under Vladimir Putin nowadays so the first sign that the way of commemoration in the Soviet Union changed um, was the eternal flame that was erected in front of the memorial in 1964 and 1964 was the year when, when Leonid Brezhnev took over the power in the Soviet Union from Nikita Khrushchev. And it was precisely under Brezhnev's rule that we, that we encountered this new way of, of celebrating the victory 
not the least in order to make clear to everyone how important the veterans have been for for the fate of the Soviet Union, and not the least, Brezhnev himself was also a veteran of the uh, Second World War. So from the mid 60s onwards, we have really this open commemoration of the losses and the tragedy of the war that was previously um, yeah, celebrated rather in, in private circumstances and not so much in order to, to boost the, the political authority of the regime. And from that time onwards, we have also pioneer guards would stand there all the time in order to demonstrate again this idea of connecting the war and the heroes of the war, the fallen of the war, with the life of the next generation in order to make sense, to give sense to their sacrifice during the war. And then the Soviet, the Soviet Union collapsed. The story of this proud victory in the um, yeah, Great Fatherland War, like it was called in the Soviet times, ended for the time being. And um, yeah, oh, sorry, here you have the inscription that was used under, under Soviet authorities. It was, as I already mentioned, dedicated to the heroes who have fallen during the liberation of Tallinn. And in 1991, this inscription was being um, taken away from the uh, new Estonian authorities. But they took some time in order to rededicate this monument, because at that time, nobody actually debated the question of yeah, what to do with this monument. Should it be in the center or should it be not? And so from 1995 on, we have a rededication a more global dedication to everyone who has fallen during the Second World War. And it was not by chance that the Estonian authorities did it only in 1995, because until summer of 1994, there were still detachments of the Russian army in Estonia. And so everybody could understand if they would have done anything to, to the monument, it might have been um, the cause for conflicts already at that time. And people wanted to avoid that dramatic um, culmination. And now we come back to this picture from 2002. And you see the new dedication engraved in the wall of the memorial to all those who have fallen in the Second World War. But you have this, this, yeah, this, this, how to put it, this, this, new dedication that was created for the occasion of this particular meeting. And if you look at the text, it says again that the meeting is being devoted to the liberators of Tallinn in September 1944. So the organizers consciously re sovietized the site of the Bronx soldier um, at that point. And again, this is of course something that did not correspond at all with um, the Estonian narrative of that time. Because what happened in 1944, in, order, in, in, in the eyes of the Estonian might mainstream, is of course no, no liberation. Even if maybe for one historical second, it has to be counted as a liberation from Nazi occupation, but um, this had to be paid with another decades of Soviet rule in the country. So in the early years of the 21st century, we have this kind of, we have this kind of escalation of the so-called war of monuments in Estonia. The thing, the issue with the Bronx soldier mobilized quite a lot of members of the Russian minority um, to demonstrate their allegiance to the Soviet forms of commemoration. But it also mobilized, on the other hand, the Estonian version of, of the past. Mm -hmm. And so we have, and so we have, sorry, my, my boy is just interrupting me. <laughs> and so we have this private initiative that happened in August 2004 when uh, people um, erected a memory 
memorial to the Estonian man who fought against Bolshevism and for the restoration of Estonian independence. What this um, relief aptly shows is, of course, that they fought the Bolshevism in German uniforms. And you can imagine that at that very point, when Estonia just entered NATO and um, the European Union in May 2004, this was, of course, out of the question to celebrate SS uniforms in Estonia. And so it was a diplomatic outcry and the government was being uh, forced to remove this monument. And this is all that was left of this monument at that time, a uh, yeah, inscription that this was a memorial for Estonian men, which stood there on this place in Lihola at the west coast of Estonia for just a few weeks in 2004. And after that, we have a huge series of, of vandalized Soviet monuments in Estonia. Um, and you have again, top left, you have again the figure of the Bronx soldier that was also vandalized with red paint. And you have quite a lot of other Soviet memorials as well. And this is precisely what is being called the War of Monuments in Estonia at that moment. And then we come already again to this escalation of this whole war of, of, of mem mem memorials, which took place in spring 2007, just at the time after an election, a parliamentary election in Estonia, when one of the leading politicians who later became prime minister, who promised that he is going to remove this monument from the center of Tallinn. And after he had won the election, he of course had to realize this, this promise. And so the Estonians did it in a very thoroughful way. They started with the exhumation of the buried Russian Red Army soldiers, and they did it with dignity. I mean, they, they invited priests from various faiths. And they later on, they sent the uh, identified bodies to the relatives in Ukraine, in Russia, and everywhere else. So they did it as, as good as you could do it. But not the least because of rumors that spread among the Russian-speaking minority, you would have these Russian, mostly Russian language protesters coming to this, this site because they feared that this, monument, that, that, that this monument is going to be destroyed by the Estonian authorities. And again, I want to show you that actually to, to understand this conflict as a Russian-Estonian conflict is not the whole truth. Because if you look at these policemen who guarded the uh, site, um, there were quite a lot of Russian um, people among those policemen, and they were clearly identifiable because they had their name tags on, on the West. And so this is also a good um, demonstration of the conflict among the Russian-speaking minority. So this is something usually is being not, what is not being really addressed when we speak about this conflict. So this is the relocation process. Um, it was taken from the city center. And even if Russian media would claim that the monument was being re relocated to the outskirts of, of the city of Tallinn, this is of course not exactly true. It is still located in the center of the city. It is located at the central military cemetery of Estonia. And it found, at least in my interpretation, a quite nice surrounding because at that site, you already have quite a lot of graves for Red Army soldiers. And so it really fits into this, into this location. Um, and this new site of, of this memorial is also ac accepted by the Russian speaking minority who would continue with the celebrations on the two important days of the former Soviet um, holiday calendar now here on this cemetery. So if you give me just one minute more to have my, not really concluding words, but um, kind of postscriptum, in order to explain to you how the whole conflict on um, 
the Bronx soldier changed also the memory landscape of, of Tallinn. First of all, of course, you have a new memorial that was erected two years later, devoted to the victory of the Estonians in the War of Independence that took place after the Russian Revolution and the First um, World War from 1918 to 1920. And this site is located around 200, 300 meters from the former site of the Bronx soldier. So this was, of course, a step to Estonicize the memorial, memorial space of the city center. And I mean, this, this monument was very popular, but on the other hand, experts, art historians, they would heavily criticize this kind of visual language that was chosen for this for this monument not the least i mean this is depicting the first military order that was issued by estonia in 1919 but um it really reminds us of, of something else as you might aptly agree so another thing that was opened just recently in 2018 is the memory for the victims of communism and even if you don't don't really think that this kind of dedication is the best way to to do it you could have chosen even for the victims of soviet terror or something like that um everybody has to agree that this monument is really something beautiful you really get a sense of, of what this monument should mean to you on Bottom right, you see these two walls. You have to go through the walls. On the walls, you have engraved the numbers of uh, the names of the victims of communism or Soviet terror. And then you turn around and you, you have this open uh, garden in front of you, which really gives you a kind of hope. And this is a positive sign. And I end my presentation with another positive sign that also the story of how to relate the past decades of, of uh, Estonian history has recently changed because the uh, Museum of Occupations that used to be focused on the two occupations, Nazi occupation and Soviet occupation, has changed its direction. And it's trying to telling now rather the story of becoming again independent and not so much the story of um, suffering under, under occupations. Thank you for your attention. What I can tell from, from my students is, of course, that, yeah, I mean, usually I, I, I talk to them as if I expect that they have been through all of it, that they remember it very vividly. But of course, they were, they were born in 2000. They have no, no memory of it at all. It's something that is really deep in the mind of the older generations. I'm quite sure about that. And I think that quite a lot of people who used to go to this memorial on the 9th of May and the 22nd of September, they of course have this conflict in mind. But how important it is nowadays, I would say that it can always be used to regain this kind of importance it had um, 15 years ago. But right now, I mean, the world has other problem problems to fight with, right? The pandemic. And so I think this is, this is something that is in the back. But it's, it's still there, you know? It's still in the minds of the people. And so I'm, I'm not so sure if, if this is something that is way back in the past and we do not speak about it anymore. It may come back. the question about the 9th of May. The 9th of May is the victory day. The victory day in the Second World War, which was at least since the uh, mid-60s, one of the most important Soviet holidays. And it's being used again in Vladimir Putin's Russia since the beginning of um, the 21st century. Um, it's a question of, of, of generations. I mean, I, I have this conflict even in my classes when you have some, some Russian speaking students who are more or less integrated and speak both languages fluently without any accent. 
and you have people who, who struggle with it, who who try to keep the Russian identification. And so this is this is also something that is not not how to put it overcome completely. The conflict is still there, but I would argue that in the younger generation, I see some some positive signs that this conflict is not the most important one, like it used to be for the older generations of those who really have experienced the Soviet time. The Holocaust has not such a place in the historic narrative of the nation, um, not the least because the numbers, the sheer numbers of victims of Estonian Jews was very, very small. It was like 1,000. So the Holocaust took place in Estonia as well. There were some 30,000 people murdered in the consecration camps in Estonia as well, coming from Jews coming from other European um, states. But for the whole period of re-independence, this whole story has not the same meaning like the story of the Soviet occupation and the number of victims of Soviet um, terror. There is a place for commemoration on the site of the former concentration camp Kloga in Estonia. <clears throat> There's also an historical um, exhibition that leads to this memorial, which has been renovated a few years ago. Um, and on the same side, close by, where you have this new new monument to the uh, victims of communism, you have actually a, a quite interesting mixture of different layers of, of commemoration. Because you have, for instance, the uh, graves of the German soldiers as well, who are being taken care of, of the uh, German organization. And there are other mon monuments as well speaking about the various layers of, of memory concerning the Second World War. So if you really take time and visit this whole site, including the Estonian Historical Museum, which is also close by, you really get a good understanding of, of what does it mean to commemorate the Second World War in Estonia nowadays. <laughs>